is your success is my number one priority. Tell your neighbor, our success is his number one priority. Look at your neighbor and say, our success is his number one priority. Good, good. That's good. Good job. So, I'm hoping everybody gets an A in this class. You can do it. Yes, you can. You don't believe me? Watch me, watch me. <laughs> so marketing, let's talk about marketing some more. Marketing, so I told you what we're going to talk about. Now I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. Is that good? Is that a good approach? So this way you don't need to ask me three times, I'm just going to tell you three times. It's better that way, right? Hope is not a plan. I have a plan for your success. All right? Hang in there. Marketing. So write this down. Marketing. Marketing. That's capital M A. You guys good? Okay. Come on, stay with me here. No sleeping. No Facebooking. Who's Facebooking now? Anybody? No text messaging. All right, no periscoping. Marketing is about creating. So marketing is about four things. Creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging value. So marketing is about creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging value. That's in chapter one. So who can tell me what marketing is? Somebody. Go ahead. What's your name? Chingus. Chingus. Go ahead. Tell us. What is marketing? I don't know, but I know it's about creating, communicating, <laughs> and exchanging value. Right. Excellent. Good job. So marketing is about creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging value. Value, what is value? Value is a function of price, quality, <coughs> and benefits. So value is a function. It's a function of the price, the quality, and the benefits. So let's make sure that we don't think that value means low price. So for something to be of a good value, it doesn't need to be a low price. It could be a high price, but it's a very high quality. And it has a lot of benefits. Do you agree? Who could explain that further? Go ahead. Tell us your name. Alvin. Albert? Alvin. Alvin? Yeah. Alvin. Alvin? <laughs> Alvin or Alvin? Alvin? Alvin. I'm getting bad coaching here. <laughs> Alvin. Go ahead. Tell us. Luxury items? Yes, luxury items. So, if you purchase a 55 inch Samsung 4K high definition LED monitor that has smart capability and 3D for $2,500 you might very well consider that to be a good value. Now you're saying, wait, coach, hold on a second. I know that I could go to Walmart and get a large flat panel LED monitor for only $5.99. So I could get a flat panel monitor 50 inch at Walmart or 55 inch at Walmart for $600. Why would I pay $2,500? Isn't that a better value? So what Alvin is suggesting that it is a good value at $2,500 because it's 4K. It's high definition 4K, not 1080p. That's 
so 2008. You're so 2000 late. <laughs> That's the old technology, 1080p. We're rocking 4K now. 4K. So that's the new high definition monitor that's on the market is 4K. So you're going to get 4K technology and 3D capability and smart capability. So it's going to be a smart TV. And so it's a good value at 2500 but again, it's not the lowest price. Value does not mean low price. Questions about that? So value does not mean low price. So that's a good example. Anybody have another example of where something might be very expensive, but not the lowest price? Yes, go ahead. Tell us your name. Teresa. Teresa, go ahead. Um, I mean, would you consider like clothing? Clothing, yes, go ahead. So Teresa's saying you could buy a pair of jeans at Old Navy for $20. Or you could buy, actually I've done this, you could buy for $300 a pair of torn jeans, <laughs> a pair of torn jeans at Diesel. So you could buy a pair of jeans for $20 at Old Navy or you could buy a pair of $300 jeans that are already torn. You gotta <laughs> love that, right? That are already torn for $300 at the diesel store. So why is $300 for a pair of diesel jeans considered to be a good value? So quality. Now the way that we communicate quality, because we said that marketing is about creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging value, the way that we communicate the value is through the brand. Now the brand is what's wrapped around the product. So all products in a given category have the same generic functionality. So for example, cars. All cars provide the same generic functionality, which is transportation. Am I right? How many people agree with that? Raise your hand. Yes, yeah, so cars provide the same generic functionality, transportation. What makes one car different from another is the brand. So every car is wrapped in a brand. Every car is wrapped in a different brand. Give me some names of cars. What are some car brands? Let's see. Go ahead. Raise your hand. <laughs> Teresa said Toyota. Going forward. Toyota. That's their tagline. The problem is, a few years ago, is their car went forward whether you wanted to or not. <laughs> so, they, I think they kind of exceeded their brand promise. That's not I, what people had expected. Go ahead. What else? So we have Toyota, Infinity, Mercedes Benz, Audi, BMW, Chevy, Lamborghini, Jaguar, Range Rover, Audi, Tesla, Jeep, Porsche. So all of those. All of those brands is what makes each of those products unique, each of those cars unique. So what makes one car unique from the other is the brand. And we're going to talk more about perceptual maps, where our brand is positioned in the marketplace relative to our competitors. That's one of the things that uh, companies spend a lot of money studying and research is the perceptions that consumers have of their brand. So you could look at um, 
let's say, the level of quality versus the price. So we want to understand whether or not customers or potential customers, or I'll use the word target market, which is discussed in chapter one, target market is different from target audience. Target market is who we want to buy our product or service. So write that down. The target market is who we want to buy our product or service. That's the target market. Who we want to buy our product or service. That's the target market. But that's not the same as the target audience. The target audience is who we want to reach with our advertising campaign. So the target audience is usually a subset of the target market. So the target market could be, for example, all men. That's our target market. Who we want to buy our product or service. But our target audience, our target audience might be grouped by age. So we're going to have a different commercial, for example, for men that are between 18 and 29, and those that are from 30 to 39, and those that are 40 to 49. Does that make sense? So you want to have a commercial, for example, that's going to resonate with your target audience. Usually, you're not going to be able to have a commercial that's going to resonate with everybody in your target audience, or more specifically with your target market. So we said all men. So when you're showing a commercial, do you think that those men that are seeing the commercial between the ages of 18 and 29 want to see somebody in the commercial who's 60 or 65? No. That's probably not something that's going to resonate with them, right? Unless maybe if it's Coach, no. If it's uh, Bruce Willis, let's say maybe if it's Bruce Willis or Sylvester Stallone or Hulk Hogan, maybe they might, um, they might, still find the commercial of interest and we'll be able to get their attention, their interest, create desire and ultimately action. So you guys know who Hulk Hogan is? Yeah. You do? What about John Cena? Yeah. You know what they say about John Cena, right? He's no good. So <laughs> Cena sucks, right? Yes. No, you guys don't think so? Oh, okay. What about... Um, what about Out of Nowhere? Who's that? You don't know who's Out of Nowhere? Out of Nowhere, that's his famous move. What? You guys are not wrestling fans. You don't know. Randy Orton. That's his thing, no? Yes. Out of Nowhere. What about Woo Woo Woo? No? You don't know who that is? Oh, you guys are not. You, know, you haven't been to Madison Square Garden. Uh, if you were there, I would have seen you. It's like better than a Broadway show. They have fireworks on the stage and everything. <laughs> it's amazing. So the brand is what distinguishes one product from another. We could look at that um, through market research to understand the perceptions that consumers have for our brand, importantly, relative to other brands. So not just where we are on the perceptual map, the value of perceptual mapping, of doing that type of market research, is that we could see where we're positioned in the market based on certain dimensions, quality, price, innovation, relative to our competitors. So remember, it's the perception. It's not a question of whether or not our product is expensive or whether it's a high quality, the issue is, what is the perception of the target market, the people that we want to buy our product? What is the perception? Do they perceive our product as being 
high quality? Do they perceive our product as being innovative? It's important to know that because in headquarters, for us just to be sitting there talking amongst ourselves saying, yes, our product is high quality, well, that's interesting, but if our target market doesn't think it's high quality, then we have a huge problem, a huge problem. However, we could solve that problem. How? How can we solve that problem if we find out that the target market actually believes that our product is a low quality versus a high quality? What do you think? Go ahead, tell us your name. Chanel. Chanel, go ahead. So advertise, Chanel is saying advertise. So when we talk about creating and communicating, communicating is really code for advertising. We're going to advertise. So we could change the perceptions that the consumers have through marketing communications. Chanel said a good example would be advertising. So the message, the key message in our advertising is going to talk about quality. Now that we found out that although we worked so hard to make our product a high quality, we found out that the target market perceives our product as being a low quality. So instead of going home crying, what we do is, what Chanel said, is develop a compelling advertising campaign to communicate that our product is of a high quality and include pillars of support. We need to have, when we advertise, we need to have pillars of support. That means that we need to have proof points. We can, it's not enough just to say our product is a high quality. We have to support that. We have to provide proof in our commercials, in our print ads, on our website. So think of marketing, another way to think about marketing, because right now, this is what we're going to talk about the entire semester, so I'm trying to give you an overview of what marketing is. So we said that marketing is about communicating, no, creating, then communicating, so does that make sense? So the order is important. So when we say marketing, marketing is about creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging value. So from 30,000 feet, if you will, that's a broad overview of what marketing is. Another thing that we could say about marketing is that marketing includes five activities. What's the first activity? The first marketing activity. The first marketing activity, write this down. The first marketing activity is to identify, identify an unmet need. The unmet what? Need. Oh. So marketing, we could describe marketing as being comprised of several activities. The first thing is to identify an unmet need that consumers have. So marketing, when we talk about marketing, the first activity is to identify, we need to identify, we need to determine a need that is not being met in the market. So it's a need that's not being met. So what would be a good example? How about shampoo? I know you're thinking, what could this guy possibly know about shampoo? <laughs> I know, right? But an unmet need is a shampoo that is safe for hair that's what? Dry. That's dry or that curly. that's curly, oily, oily that's permed. So the way we identify the need is how? Guess. Guess. Oh, you're not, they're not good at guessing. <laughs> That's not good for exam day. You gotta be good guessers. Right? 
The way we're going to determine the need is through marketing research. We're going to do marketing research. That's how we're going to identify what the needs are. The first step is to, is to conduct marketing research. We could do qualitative research like focus groups where we have 12 people in a room and with a moderator we ask them a series of questions like what are some of the problems that they have when cooking or baking and what do you think they're going to say? Food sticks to the pot, food sticks to the pan, for example. But remember, when we do focus groups, there's only 10 or 12 people in each focus group. When we do focus groups, we do four focus groups at a time. So we do two focus groups in two different cities. But we still only have 48 people that participated. That's not a lot. That's qualitative research. We don't have anything statistically significant. All we have is the input of 48 people. That costs $50,000. That's a real number. $50,000. I have a lot of experience in marketing, $50,000. You want to do focus groups? See me after class. Okay, so, and with your checkbook. All right, so it's $50,000. That's tremendously valuable to do focus groups because we're going to get a tremendous amount of insight from those, for example, who bake, those who cook, those who, um, who use tablets or smart TVs, whatever it is that we're researching, it's very helpful to do that because what that's going to do is inform our quantitative research. A form of quantitative research is what we're doing this semester, which is a questionnaire. So a questionnaire, our goal in industry is to get a representative random sample of how many? A million people? So in the United States, if we're going to research the needs and wants of people that bake and cook, how many people do we need to have complete the questionnaire? What do you think? A million? Now there's about 350 million people that live in the United States. How many of them do we need to complete that questionnaire? Now if 350 million people complete the questionnaire, that's called the what? Census. A census is when 100% of the population participates in the research. Only the government does that. They're really the only one that could afford to do that. What we're trying to do is get a representative random sample from that population. So it doesn't need to be 350 million. How many does it need to be? 349 million? 300 million? 200 million? What do you think? A quarter of? What's the number? How many is that? <laughs> so you want me to do the math? So what we're saying is 85 million? I think it has to be a balance sample, like from every type of person who bakes or cook, that we take somebody up out of this group and from different states maybe, and that we do this, uh, the research with these people. Absolutely. So we have to have males and females, people of different age groups, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s people of different ethnicities, people of different religions. So how many people do we need to participate? Ayala? So there's no definite answer, but I'll tell you from my experience, about a thousand people. So if you have a representative random sample that's going to include people of different genders, people of different age groups, people of different ethnicities, people of different religions. A thousand can be statistically significant, a thousand to fifteen hundred, but in most categories in the United States it doesn't need to be more than that, so it definitely doesn't need to be a million people. 
All right, so for marketing research, we need something that's statistically significant. In the United States, in most categories, it really doesn't need to be um, more than 1500 And how much is that going to cost? $150,000 to do mall intercept in multiple cities and get approximately 1,500 um, respondents. Now, when we do focus groups, we also do multiple rounds of focus groups because each round is iterative. So we learn from the first round of focus groups and then we incorporate that in the next round before we do the quantitative research. So we could do certainly qualitative research. I recommend that, do the focus groups. Then we're gonna do quantitative research. Before that, now both of those focus groups and questionnaires, qualitative and quantitative research, as I described them,